What we do, honeys, welcome back to another episode of whatever this is at this point. My name is Chama and let's get into the video. So today's video is going to be about Alice Lenshina. If you guys don't know the story, I did my research and I'm here to give you the tea, okay? Lenga Lubosha was born in the Kosomo village of Tinsali district in northern province Zambia. Her dad was a polygamous man which means that he had multiple wives, multiple women. This nigga was busy, basically. He was booked and busy, all right? So um, he often neglected Alice's family, his first wife's family, and they were often left in, like, extreme poverty, and they didn't really have, like, a good upbringing, weren't well-to-do or anything. You're probably wondering why I'm calling her, well, why in the beginning I did say Alice Lenshina. She received the name Lenshina, which is the Bemba version of the Latin name Regina, which means queen, after being baptized. As was the norm in Africa at that time, there were a lot of missionaries, Christian missionaries in, in the region. In Chinsali, Alice's hometown, the two competing churches were the Roman Catholic missionaries of Africa, aka the White Fathers. The second one was the United Free Church of Scotland, which Lenshina belonged to. So that's, she was, she grew up religious and that's the church that she went to. Now, like, everybody know the missionaries weren't here to, like, they weren't here for goodwill. Um, they came in to destabilize local tribes and local communities so that it would be easier for these countries to be colonized. So fast forward to 1934, Alice is now a young, like, she's a teenager. She's 14 years old. She got married to Gibson Kwale and she had one child with him and then shortly after he died. Um, and as per something called wife inheritance in Bemba, and basically what happens is that the widow um, of the deceased uh, has to marry someone in the family. So it could be his cousin, it could be his brother or something like that as a way of sort of like spiritual cleansing. And so Alice wasn't exempt and she ended up marrying Petros Chintankwa. Um, they had five children and, you know, life was Gucci. Everything was okay. Lenshina was like a loving and present mother and I think throughout the story you're sort of going to see that she was just like a warm I feel like if I would describe her if I met her or I would describe her as that's like a warm loving person a giving person very caring yeah so she was like an avid ch church goer she was an active member of the community. She liked to give to charity, liked to help out whoever she could help out. Okay, so in 1953, October 24th, 1953, she fell very ill. She had cerebral malaria and um, she ended up having a seizure. And then um, shortly after she fell into a three-day coma. There wasn't like a medicine wasn't really that advanced her family just concluded like yo she gone they started preparing for her funeral and it was at that time when they started preparing for her funeral that she regained consciousness this is where the story gets interesting because alice regained consciousness and said that during her coma she had basically died and she met up with jesus and his angels and he gave her a special message to Take back to the world i'm not gonna go into like the details like too much detail of the message because it's like it's a whole thing she she basically told like how she saw him where she saw him where they were at what they did but the substance of the message is that he told her to save the world by steering away from modern religion so that would be like the missionaries and all of that stuff and incorporating traditional values so you know bemba values traditional values cultural values and also steering away from sorcery so then after that message lenchina made it her personal mission to preach to the masses um she was a member of the presbyterian church and she went back preaching her special message while incorporating bemba culture she had a special interest in the matrilineal aspects of Bemba culture. Before the ma before the I was about to say before the matriarchy, but before the missionaries um, 
started to invade Africa and you know that part of um, that part of Zambia the Bembas were very matrilineal meaning that women were the head of the family most times they're the ones that made the important decisions for the family and all of that jazz so it was it was good vibes back then clearly it was good vibes however in 1954 these haters at the church were just like nah alice you can't be preaching this stuff they they say they didn't like how she incorporated bimba culture they didn't like how she wanted to put women at the forefront of the church they said stuff like she lacked proper missionary training but you know the reality of it was that she had gained so much attention from people they didn't want a woman gaining that amassing that amount of attention you know it was unheard of at the time so they expelled her from the church but by the time that they expelled her she had already gained a huge following and had already made a name for herself in the community in the villages and all of that stuff so she already had a following In 1958, a grand temple, which was huge, I'm going to insert a, a picture of it now, was built in Sione, and it was called Zion. The church building itself was only about 25 miles from the White Fathers, so the Catholic Church, the biggest Catholic church in Northern Rhodesia at the time. But it was built to be bigger. It was basically to show up, to be like, yo, look at us, we're doing the things, and we don't need y'all. You cannot compete where you don't compare. So carry on was so successful that by the late 1950s it had 60,000 to 150,000 followers within northern Rhodesia that's like that's hectic that's huge and it wasn't just northern Rhodesia it was um, surrounding countries so Nyasaland modern day Malawi Tanganyika modern day Tanzania and um, Belgian Congo so DRC Congo and her followers showed loyalty by building smaller churches in their villages. And they also took pilgrimage to her village in um, Sione or Zion. It was the fastest growing church in Africa. And in two years, it had surpassed the missionary churches that were here. So in her teachings, she condemned witchcraft, sorcery, when they would go to these services a lot of people would hand over like amulets and charms and like stuff used for witchcraft they would also pay a small fee to lenshina for that stuff to be to valenshina a eh? to valenshina for that stuff to be um that stuff to be burnt by her basically absorbing themselves of witchcraft she was heavily against things like polygamy drinking smoking and the practice of wife inheritance or widow in, widow inheritance that she that she succumbed to or that she suffered. The Lumpa Church was also one of the first churches worldwide to put women at the forefront. It, it was unheard of to have women at the forefront of a church, but she made it a point to make sure that women were at the forefront of the of the church, and she wanted to bring back in that matrilineal aspect of, a, of her culture that we spoke about earlier. So like points to Alice for putting women in active leadership roles at a time when it was like, what? People didn't vibe with that. They thought it was, they thought it was crazy. The church also embraced everyone regardless of their class, their social standing, their tribe. Um, it embraced everyone. It is also often said that the Lumpa church is sort of like a foundation for feminism in Zambia. Part of the teachings that Valentina adopted was just the rejection of earthly authority. So that meant that her followers didn't really like answer to the chiefs and they also didn't answer to the missionaries. So the missionaries, they started to slander her. They started to talk like mad things about her, that she's crazy that she's demon possessed they started to say that her church is just like a money-making scheme even though the whole time that all of this was going on valentina maintained her humility and her chilled lifestyle so she had like church counselors that helped her run the church those guys those guys were a bit shady because those guys they went from zero to hero and you know people started to grow suspicious mm, what's happening 
Yeah, but the white fathers worked over time. They were haters. They were just like, nah. Every chance they could get, they had sermons about her in their churches to undermine her so that they could put a dent in her following. It wasn't just the white fathers, even Chitimukulu, who was the who was the chief or I would say like a king, paramount chief in the region. He started to grow suspicious. Now Lalenchina's followers were always like, Y'all, we know no government. We know no chiefs. We only know Lenshina. So, can you imagine? They tried to scare the followers. You try to say whatever it was that they could say about her. But it never worked. If anything, it just gained her more popularity. So, let's now fast forward to 1960. Her church had gained about 200,000 followers. And it wasn't just the biggest church in Zambia. It was the biggest church in the region, possibly the biggest church in Africa. Now, we have gone through, like, the basic history of this church. And you're probably wondering at this point, like, all the old, like, what? what? Why don't I know her? You know, why, why wasn't she in your history book? If she had such a big influence, why don't we know about her? This is where it gets interesting. All right, um, so listen, just listen good. Dial it back a bit. Like um, we, we already know at this point with um, Valenciana and the Lumpa Church, we're in the 1960s, but I'm going to dial it back to 1924 when Zambia became a British colony, right? So Zambia became a British colony, was mostly run by the white people, the colonizers. They took over. Um, there was a political party, it was the African National Congress that tried to gain seats in parliaments and tried to speak for the black voices. But they didn't really have a lot of influence because of the way that they went about things. They were seen as like soft and like they were comfortable with the status quo. So in 1958, Kenneth Kaunda broke away from the ANC and he created his own party, which was the United... Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. United National Independence Party. I got it. UNIP. UNIP basically promised people that if they joined UNIP, this was like their selling story. They were like, come join us. If you join us, we're going to liberate the country. And you guys are going to be as wealthy as the Europeans. Beans. Even though there was like no proper basis for this, it was a good like selling point. People were like, I bet I'm joining. Okay. What? Like, what's up with that? So UNIP gained a lot of popularity in the same way that the Lumpa Church did. So we know how this story goes. UNIP and KK gained political influence. Kenneth Kaunda was basically on the path to establishing an authoritarian government. Because of the way that UNIP was growing and the way that membership for UNIP was growing, there was like an unspoken competition in the beginning between UNIP and the Lumpa Church. Because remember, in the Lumpa Church ideologies, their members were not allowed to answer to earthly authorities. Obviously, there were some Lumpa Church members that joined UNIP, but then they couldn't really overlap because in as much as they had the same ideologies in as far as not answering to the man, not answering to the white man, they didn't have the same ideologies in as far as like politics go. Politics and politicians would be earthly authorities. Eventually, KK started to see the Lumpa Church as a threat. He started to say the same things that the missionaries said about uh, Valenciana in like the beginning. So, oh, she's demon possessed. Oh, she's mad. She used to make her members drink urine. And I was like, no girl, that was a lie. He to like dissuade her followers or dissuade people from following her. Valentina didn't really like involve herself in politics. Obviously her members did end up getting into politics. Her counselors sometimes like dabbled in politics. Between 1961 and 1963 because of the tension that had arose between the two groups, UNIP members started to verbally and sometimes physically abuse Lumpa Church members. They wanted to exert their power and given that, you know, UNIP had a lot of political influence, they got away with it. So these were like kadas. They were they were kadas harassing people because they didn't like what those people believed in and they couldn't stand people having different opinions than them. Lumpa Church members were peaceful people. It was like rare that 
they retaliated. So at this point, um, Alice is tired. Like I would, I would be tired. I would be like, well, damn, like I'm leaving. I'm dipping. Miss Alice was like, nah, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to put, continue putting my members in, in danger. And so she asked her members to move out of the villages and establish their own villages away from Unip, Unip members and Unip Kada for their own safety. The church, the Lumpa church, established isolations away from the outside world. They segregated from society. They started to have their own courts and they refused to pay taxes. I don't blame them. They refused to be like a registered organization or to register their organization with the state. When I was doing my research, people were like, that's the blueprint of a cult. And I don't think that was her initial intention. She did that to protect her people. They were being harassed. Like, if you are being harassed on a daily basis, must you just sit and take it? No, she did it to protect them. I don't think she sat out and be like, all right, gonna form myself a cult. I don't think that was the point. I think that she genuinely was just protecting her people from harassment. So this was 1963. In 1964, KK took over government and he was like on the highway to being the dictator that he always wanted to be. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not disrespecting him or anything. I don't want you guys to come for me in the comments that you need to respect KK. But the reality of it is that he he ruled for 30 years. It's now July 1964 and KK is just basically fed up. He saw them as a threat, especially with like the upcoming independence and all of that stuff. He was just like, nah, I'm not having this. I'm not going to have like two separate states within the state. We fought so hard for independence and though, why would I give anyone religious freedom? Like, what so rude. These people have gone to their own villages. They're keeping to themselves. But Unip still didn't like it. KK still didn't like it. He kept on influencing Unip members to go and attack this one. Whichever way that he saw it, these people were a threat to him and were a threat to um, what was going to be Zambia. They kept on being aggressive towards these people, kept on going to their villages, attacking them. And these people like were not fighting back. But there's only so much people can take. The Lumpa Church started to fight back. And these confrontations started to become violent and constant. And before independence, KK was like, I'm giving you guys up until this point to rejoin society or we're just going to keep on attacking. Miss Alice was just like, nah, I'm not having it. I'm not going to succumb to threats. And we've done nothing wrong. Unip saw this refusal and KK saw this refusal as undermining his authority. He sent state troopers and Unip cutters to go to these villages and attack. This time hit them harder. And this initial confrontation, a hundred Lumpa church members were killed. That should have been enough, right? That should have been, they should have said, okay, fine, we've made a point. Maybe they'll come back in their own time, but uh, no, that's not what happened. The Lumba church members obviously wanted justice for the people that were killed. They started to riot and they started to intensify the way that they fought back. Um, their riots were not as violent as like unique member riots. Because of the riots, KK declared it a state of emergency sent the state troops uh, more state troops they didn't really have like proper training so these people were just given guns and they said they were told go like go go do your thing go do your worst on July 24th 1964 a gun battle broke out between the Lumpa church members and unique uh, members and state troopers at this point, uh, Ms. Lenshina said, you know, enough is enough. Uh, I'm just going to turn myself in. But her husband and um, the other church leaders or counselors said, no, you're not going to turn yourself in now. It's too da dangerous. You could get killed. So she had to go run and hide somewhere in the village while she witnessed her people get slaughtered. Church members were massacred. Women were raped before you know, getting stabbed with um, 
spears and stuff before getting shot the villages were looted um, they stole their livestock i'm gonna put like a video even though the video that it was described in the books that i've read the video that i'm putting up now that the video that i'm showing you is like it it's not even it doesn't look as bad as it actually was about a thousand people lost their lives that day and this came to be known as the lumpa uprising the lumpa church was eventually banned on august 3rd 1964 and a few days later alice lenshina and her husband turned themselves in about 15,000 to 20,000 people were displaced they ran for their lives and fled the country um, many of them crossed over to drc um, never returned to zambia and another 2,000, about yeah, 2,000 to 3,500 were killed in the months that followed the initial, the, the uprising. Alice Lenchina herself played no significant role in the, the Lumpa Church's political activities. She regretted that political actions weakened the religious impact of her message. I guess the the fight for independence and the fight to be an independent nation and to become Zambia superseded those people's lives and those people's choices. Alice never faced trial, but she was detained. Her and her husband were detained in Mumbwa district uh, beginning August of 1964. 1965, they were moved to a minimum security prison in Kalabo near the Angolan border. They attempted escape in um, 1967. They were caught and jailed for six months and then restricted in Mukoshi district. In May 1970, Kaonda placed uh, Miss Alice Lenshina under house arrest in Chilenje, Lusaka. In 1972, her husband passed away and on 7th December 1978, Alice, the Queen, Lenshina, passed away. Her funeral was held in her home village. She was buried at the site where her church once stood. It's just crazy to me that such a significant thing happened. So many people lost their lives. Such, a, such an influential woman lived. So yeah, that's the story of Miss Alice. Lenchina, Alice Lenchina. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any additional information or if you'd like me to cover another story or another person in history, please feel free to recommend what you'd like me to talk about in the comment section below.